Let's pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. It took six days. Six days for people to be reminded that the turn of a calendar into 2021 wouldn't, get, wouldn't remove bad things from happening. Six days, that's what it took. Shouldn't surprise us. That happens in this world, right? Because bad things don't happen out there. Bad things start in here. That shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us that each and every one of us has the kind of heart that is not the way it's supposed to be. It should not surprise us that a, that a bad heart with a sinful condition is going to struggle with pain and anger and rage and frustration and sadness and guilt. It should not surprise us. Therefore, it shouldn't surprise us that a heart struggling with pain and guilt and anger is also going to lead to bad actions. Shouldn't surprise us. A bad heart leads to bad feelings, leads to bad emotions, bad actions. It's true. A heart with the kind of condition that mine has is going to want to sin. And so is yours. I mean, do we really think that just because we're here on a Sunday morning and we're not looting somewhere or rioting somewhere. Do we really think that we don't have any sin? I mean, maybe sometimes we, we see the events that happened this past week on Wednesday and we think to ourselves, oh, I could never. How could anyone ever do those kinds of things? That's terrible. You know, that kind of attitude is sinful, right? That, that kind of attitude that says someone else is beneath me. I would never stoop down to those kinds of levels. That's just called arrogance, pride, ego. That's just lying to think that there's different levels of sin. It's also the kind of sin where you're looking for specks in other people's eyes when you've got planks in your own eyes blinding you. It's also the kind of sin where you know that God's rightful spot is to sit on heaven's throne and he's the judge. He's the one who, who knows people's hearts. But it, that kind of sin, that kind of attitude towards people is, is like telling the Lord, well, maybe just can you give me five minutes to sit on your throne every day? Five minutes where I can just make my own judgments and my own condemnations based on my own attitudes. Sinful heart, sinful actions. Maybe when you see the kinds of, excuse me, when you see the kinds of things that happen on Wednesday, maybe your thought is good. Somebody needs to shake this country up. Somebody needs to get the message out that things are broken and we're not happy. And you know, it takes, uh, you got to crack a couple eggs to make an omelet, right? That's also a sinful attitude. That's the kind of attitude that comes from somebody who's harboring grudge or resentment or anger. The Bible says those things aren't good for you. It's also the kind of attitude that doesn't honor and respect the authorities that the Lord has placed over us. Authorities that the Lord says are good for us. It's also the kind of attitude that, that looks at the problems of this world and says, you know, in order to fix those kinds of problems, we just need better government or better laws. Or maybe we just need a good riot every now and then. And that's not what fixes the world's problems. The only thing that fixes the problem of the sinful heart is law and gospel. So to think that anything else is the problem and anything else needs to fix the problem is to almost be unchristian. To focus on something that's not the best solution, the only solution in Christ. No, it's true. There is sin in our hearts. And there is sin on our hands. And when God's law helps you realize that, when God's law helps you see the condition of your heart and that there's no way for you to cover it up, there's no way for you to get rid of it on your own, when, when you realize there's only one thing you can do. Confess it. 
Acknowledge what's going on in your heart. Acknowledge the kind of person you are. That's what people were doing in the countryside around the Jordan. In verse 5 it says, The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, John the Baptist, confessing their sins. Why in the world would people do that if they didn't have a sinful heart? Why in the world would people do that if they thought they could cover up their sins in some way? Why in the world would people do that if they thought they could make up for their sins with some religious works or with some good deeds or with some generous offerings? Why in the world would people do that if they thought other people's sins were worse and they really needed some serious forgiveness? But I'm okay. Why would people do that at all? Unless they realized. Unless John's message of repentance was sinking in. That we need to confess who we are and what we've done. John the Baptist, his ministry, his work was helpful and useful and beneficial for people who realize the sinful condition of our hearts. But John did not want people to wallow in that sinful heart. Wallow in that guilt and sadness. Because that's not good for your heart either. People who who understand what's wrong with them, they need the answer to what plagues them. People who who see that it's the sinful heart that's the real problem. They don't need a better leader. They don't need better laws. They don't need rage or revenge. People who know the sinful condition of their heart, they need, and they confess it to God, they, they need His forgiveness. People who know the sinful condition of their heart, they need to know that God is not our enemy, but He is the one who is for us. He is the one who who wants to come to us with his forgiveness and his peace. People who know the sinful condition of their heart, they, they want to know about God's compassion and his mercy, God's power and his presence in our life. And so John the Baptist was not just a preacher. He was also a baptizer. Because baptism is something God does. Baptism is not some churchy tradition. To make you feel all kind of saintly and good. Baptism is something God does for sinners. For people who have a sinful heart. Whether they're a couple days old or years and years old. Baptism is something God does to assure us that he is on our side. Baptism is something God does to assure us that we are cleansed and forgiven. Baptism is something God does to make us his family. To make us heirs of heaven. So the question is, why in the world would Jesus, of all people, show up at the Jordan River to be baptized? Jesus didn't have any sins to confess. Jesus didn't have any kind of sinful condition of the heart. Jesus didn't have any need for forgiveness at all. And Jesus didn't need to be assured that God was on his side, did he? (laughs) Because he is God. (laughs) He didn't need, oh, I wonder, is God for me? Is he my father? I don't know. None of that. And yet, today as we talk about the baptism of our Lord, it's the perfect place for our Savior to show up. It's the perfect place because of what Jesus was here to do. Jesus was not here to be some great political leader, some great motivational speaker. Jesus was here to be our Savior. To stand in our place. To see our world the way it really is. To to see our hearts. To see the kinds of things that we do. To fight off the kind of temptations that, that grab us every day. To be the perfect lamb The perfect lamb who could offer his life as the sacrifice for sins. To be the one who could could suffer the punishment and count for everyone. That's what Jesus was here to do. We can never forget that Jesus came to this world not to show us what to do, but to do it for us. We can never forget 
that Jesus came to this world not to teach us a better way of life, but to give us the only way of life. We have to remember that Jesus came to this world not to give us a better version of ourselves, but to give us peace with God and eternal life in heaven. That's why Jesus is here. That's why it's the perfect place for him to show up in the Jordan River, to do something for us, to let people know who he was. See, he didn't just settle down in Bethlehem, right? And he didn't just settle down in Egypt. And then when they moved to Nazareth, he didn't just settle down there. He didn't just stay put and everyone else had to come to him. He, didn't, he wasn't content to just be known as the carpenter's son. No, this news of who Jesus is, it had to get out. It had to get on the move so that people would know that God's chosen one was here. And when Jesus showed up at the Jordan River, then God did not stay quiet, did he? Instead, we hear this at the end of the reading. From the, the voice came from heaven, You are my son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. The baptism of the Jordan River of Jesus is something that confirms what has been very clear ever since Jesus was conceived. Jesus is God's perfect choice. The perfect choice of the Savior. Because he literally came from heaven with a perfect life that we need. He came from heaven to fight off the enemies that we could never fight off. He came to, to be here to, to be what we could not be. That's why we like to call Jesus our substitute. Did you hear that in the hymn, the last verse? Now, raise, now rise, faint hearts, be resolute. This man is Christ, your substitute. Sometimes hymns just say it well, and I like that, I like that line. Jesus was here for us in our place so that we could someday be in his place, heaven. And so God made sure people knew who this was, his own son, the one he loved, the one who was pleasing in everything, in his being and in his life, the one who would do everything just the way God had planned it, not missing one single day, not taking one uh, vacation from any of it, but every single moment living for us, doing what we couldn't. There's a lot of stuff here in Mark chapter 1, isn't there? Some great reminders that we need when the world is going crazy. And spoiler alert, I can probably tell you already what's going to happen in 2021. There's going to be sin. There's going to be problems. There's going to be pain. There's going to be hardships. There's going to be struggle. When that kind of thing happens, here's a great reminder that the real cause, the real problem, is not out there. It's right here. When I start to get burdened by that guilt, by the sins that I know I'm going to do, here's a great reminder that confession and forgiveness is what God gives to us. Acknowledging who we are, that's a blessing of being God's people. And, and then being able to see that God has provided exactly what we need in Jesus. When we start to forget or maybe get a little bit lazy about who Jesus is. Here's a great reminder that he is God's son, that he is the chosen one, that he rightly wears that title of the anointed one. You know that Jesus Christ, Christ isn't just his last name. You know that, right? That's his title, the anointed one. So in the Old Testament, it was called the Messiah. New Testament, it's called the Christ. He rightly wears that title for us. He's the lamb of sacrifice. The perfect substitute. When we start to think that Jesus' job here, when we get a little confused about what Jesus' job was here in this world, here's a perfect reminder that Jesus' job was not to set all things in order and to kind of balance out the power in this world. That his job was not to make great laws and be a motivational speaker. That his job in this world was to get down and dirty for us, to do what we couldn't, to suffer our punishment to fight off the devil, to go to hell and back for us so that we could have peace with God. You didn't know all that was in here, did you? A lot of stuff. A lot of great reminders in a simple event like Jesus' baptism. And maybe we have time for just one more. 
You know, baptism didn't stop when John the Baptist stopped. The power of baptism is something we still use today. Maybe it's a little bit different now than when John the Baptist was doing it. The, the power is still the same. The person is still the same. The promises are still the same. But the perspective that we have is a little bit different because we see the full picture. See, John the Baptist was pointing to Jesus. He's the Messiah but there were plenty, for those three years that Jesus was doing his work, when Jesus was moving around in Palestine, plenty of people kind of wondering what was he supposed to be doing? What kind of Messiah? Wasn't he supposed to deliver us from our earthly enemies and set up a kingdom in Jerusalem? There was always some kind of confusion. We see the full picture of how Jesus lived for us and then died for us. He suffered what we deserve. We see the full picture that Jesus conquered our fiercest enemies of sin, death, and hell. We see the full picture that Jesus came back from the dead with victory for us. We see the full picture that Jesus, all of his work in this world was done, so he ascended back to his throne in heaven. That's a good thing, because there on the throne he rules all things for the benefit of his church. We see how Jesus, he kept his promise and sent the Holy Spirit to work through the word and the sacraments powerfully, Connecting people to Jesus through faith. We see all of this from this glorious perspective that the mission is complete, that God's people have peace. Baptism is something we still get to use. We still get the assurance that God washes us clean. We still get the assurance that that God connects us to Jesus, that we are part of God's family. We still get the assurance that God speaks his name over us. We still get the assurance that everything unpleasing about us, God takes away so that we are pure and holy in his sight. We still have the assurance that, that God is our Father, working for our benefit, working for our good, our spiritual good, our eternal good. All of that with the water of baptism. All of that in something so simple. Something that we can kind of understand. Take a little water, say God's name, and God does something impressive and miraculous. All of that we have. All of that we still enjoy. All of that we still use. That's why, brothers and sisters, we still get on the move we're going to be talking about that all for, through this series, about how we continue to use the, the Lord. We continue to use His Word and sacraments. We continue to work in His ministry because God wants His Word to have more homes in more hearts. We see that in the way Jesus did His work. We see how that's still what God wants for His church today. And don't you think the world can use that? It took six days. Six days into this new year to realize that people are still hurting, people are still broken, people are still struggling, they're still angry. People still need forgiveness. They still need peace and hope and joy. They still need a relationship with God. They still need the Holy Spirit to take up residence in their heart. God has given us all of that. It starts with His Word, and it starts with water. Amen. Amen.